Hello and good evening. Welcome along. Hello, everyone. On YouTube and on Facebook, this is Mythical Ireland Book Talk. I'm Anthony Murphy. You're very welcome along. I'm delighted to have you in the library this evening. We are on episode nine of Book Talk. We've completed 127 episodes of Live Irish Myths. Yes, 127. We're on uh, episode nine of Book Talk tonight. Uh, is, uh, I think, an interesting one. It is The Origins of the Irish by J.P. Mallory, uh, known to his friends as Jim Mallory or Professor Jim Mallory. So I'm looking forward to that. Hope you're all keeping safe and well and that everybody has been uh, behaving themselves and is uh, especially behaving themselves because you know who is watching. He's always watching. Joined on the lower shelf by uh, Frosty the Snowman. So Santa and Frosty say hello. And on YouTube tonight, the first of the viewers to say hello is John Main, Panachti as Dun Mashed, Baltimore, on Toa Galair. Good evening to you, John. I didn't realize that was Baltimore's Irish name. What's Shed? You might shed some light on that for me. But uh, good evening to you. Long time no talk. Mandy McCurl is also in the house. Hello, everyone, from a frosty and snow sprinkled Isle of Mull. Looking forward to this talk with a hot chocolate. And a wee nip of homemade bramble vodka tonight, Slauncha. Mandy McCurl, I would like to raid your drink for your drinks cabinet. <laughs> Sounds lovely. Enjoy it. Uh, Daisy Peter says, Hi, Anthony, and all of our two other myth flicks. My biggest curiosity is how Irish history was built. The origins of the Irish people. It gives me a deep feeling of some branch of my origins, too. Very good. Daisy, I think you'll enjoy this one. Stephen Walker says, great book. Can't disagree with you, Stephen. And on Facebook tonight, Robin L. Rickman is the first of the commenters. Says, hello, Slauncha, Robin. Charlie Grover says, good evening, sir. Hello, Charlie. Welcome along. Jackie says, Fasker what? August Trinonawa. Tusa Fain. Jackie, welcome along. Stephen O'Hara says, good evening, everyone. Trinonawa. Tusa Fain. Stephen Margaret Kiernan says, hello. Surprise, surprise. Well, Kel, surprise. Uh, well, it shouldn't be. I, yes, you may have probably typical of Facebook. You may have missed the fact that I advertised it uh, 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 in the middle of the day today, around 12 o'clock or one o'clock. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if Facebook hadn't shown you that because uh, that's the way it goes. And Scott Doherty says, greetings, everyone, and greetings to you. And welcome along. Joe Butler is in a chilly and sunny Colorado. Hello, Joe. Welcome to you. Ralph Waldron says is saying good evening from Ath League. Good to see you, Ralph. Steve Martinson says, hello, Anthony, and everyone able to see this today. Love to you all. Thank you, Steve, and the same right back at you. Lexi Erickson says, hello, been looking forward to this. Good stuff. Ali Athy Thompson says, good evening, Anthony. Hello, Ali. Uh, welcome to the house. Welcome to the library. Mariana Dunn says, hello, all. Christmas cookie cooking going on in our kitchen today in Virginia. Brilliant. Come here, save us one, will you? Oh, with the pandemic, they probably won't let. Ah, sure, look, maybe next year, but enjoy them. Nancy Sterling says, good evening to everyone. Hello, Nancy. Welcome along. Joanne Wolf is in Pennsylvania in the USA. Hello, Joanne. Stacy Herman Lawrence says, hi, Anthony. O Ohio, USA, cold and clear and making some dinner while listening in. Very nice. Well, I hope that is an enjoyable feast. Paula Snow Queen is doing the usual wavy handy thing. <laughs> hello, Paula. Janet Moran says, hello, Anthony and the tour from sunny, mild Boston. Looking forward to this voyage. Hello, Janet. Yvette Tillema is in the house. Thanks again, Mr. Murphy. Greetings, Tua. Yes, indeed. You don't need me to tell you what book it is today, Yvette. Good to see you. Federica Guy is in the house. Hi, Anthony. Hi, all of you. Waiting for the snow here in Torino. Yeah, and apparently there has already been a sprinkling of snow in parts of Ireland. And uh, it's to be very, very cold tonight, but very windy too. So it'll be interesting to see what tomorrow brings weather-wise. Valerie Gallagher says, hello all, Giagic, Valerie. Anne Busby is in Canada. Hello, Anne. Falcha, good evening to you. Dave Dowling says, greetings from Trim. Balia Autrum. Hello, Dave, and welcome. Zandrew Reguera says, hello, Anthony and Tua. Greetings from Argentina. Always a great pleasure to welcome our Argentinian friends into the library. And oh, Anne Hurley, he says, oh, love and warm hugs to all the beautiful people. Uh, what about us ugly ones, Anne? <laughs> oh, joke. Terrible joke. Uh, Shailen Kylie says, greetings from snowy Michigan. My wife loves snow at Christmas time. She is hoping for a white Christmas. Paula Strickland says, hello, 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 from Virginia Beach, Virginia. 
Hello, Paula. Good evening. Hello, hello, hello. Lexi Erickson says it's warmer than yesterday. That's a good sign. <laughs> Where is it warmer than it was yesterday? Not here, definitely. Uh, the Full Irish GK is on YouTube, says Giagwich to a Davek underscore 89666 says, let's get to the good stuff. Love from Athlone. Yes, that's indeed. John Main says, Fort of the Jewels. Interesting. Jackie Stevenson is here, says, hello, Anthony. Looking forward to this book. Uh, Grace Tori McGregor says hello from Rochester, New York. Hello, Grace. Jerry Andrade says hello from Merseyside. Sounds an interesting subject tonight, Anthony. Well, it certainly is. I hope you agree. Anyway, uh, great. Uh, not like live Irish myths where we have to go on for 15 minutes. We can get started pretty quickly. So uh, there are two things uh, before we actually start talking about the book. Uh, the first is uh, I want to make reference to uh, Live Irish Myths episode 127 and an incident that took place in which a certain lady challenged me as to why she had been banned from the Mythical Ireland community. Uh, I removed her. I deleted her comment and removed her from the live stream because, you know, that was basically trolling. Um, she then emailed me uh, and a male friend of hers uh, tried to spam the Mythical Ireland community, the Mythical Ireland Facebook page, and the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel uh, with derogatory uh, messages. Uh, all I can say is that the behaviour uh, from both of them uh, left me convinced that I absolutely did the right thing in removing her from the community. Uh, she had broken the rules. She had broken two rules. Uh, and so I would always say, look, don't mistake my niceness for softness. That if somebody come, if you come into a stranger's house, you behave yourself. You don't start wrecking the furniture, because if you do, you get thrown out, and that is the way it is. Anyway, no more about that. I expect they will uh, communicate with me further if they're uh, have, having seen this, uh, but I don't care because I defend my actions, uh, and it's just as simple as that. The community is ten thousand strong now, and there's a certain vibe to it. And the reason that vibe is there is because I've managed to keep uh, a certain type of person away from the group. And the way I do that is to ban them and delete them when they misbehave. And so if you misbehave, you can't expect to be left uh, in situ. And I think most rational people would agree with that. Anyway, it's not often that we have difficulty with trolling uh, on Mythical Ireland, thankfully. Uh, but as I say, definitely not impressed with the... Uh, uh, the the campaign, which it's certainly felt like, uh, to perhaps intimidate me into reversing the decision. The decision is made. The decision is final, and that lady will not be readmitted. And I will not be mentioning names either, because that's not my style. The other thing is that you'll be very excited to know that uh, I foresee a long future for this uh, series. Uh, anyway, we're going to completely change the tone now. That needed to be said, uh, and if there are people who intend to troll and misbehave well you got your warning don't mistake uh, the niceness for softness um we are well there's 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 i think there's about 900 books now on the shelves in the past few days here in ireland uh, we've had a reopening uh, after a six week uh, hiatus uh, during which we had a lockdown and an awful lot of um an awful lot of um, retail outlets were closed, including the bookshops and the secondhand stores. So um, I made my way as soon as it was open to the nearest uh, secondhand uh, bookstore. And I, uh, I got myself a little treasure trove of material. So. Uh, Tom King is in the house, and I miss Tom, as is Julie Gerst, Sheila Gunn, uh, Elizabeth Marks Martinez is in uh, Austria, and Dolmac McDermott is in the house as well. Hello to you all. And I mean, one that's probably irrelevant to Mythical Ireland, but uh, I couldn't resist picking it up off the shelf was Moby Dick <laughs> uh, by uh, her, her, our friend uh, Herman Melville. I've never read it, and it's a beautiful hardback. Uh, a little hardback uh, copy with lovely, soft, almost, they're non-glossy, but they feel glossy, creamy pages and small print. 
very, a very nice one to have on the shelf. Anyway, the rest is definitely relevant, you know? Aran Islands of Legend. Now, uh, this is about the Aran Islands, obviously off the West Coast. Uh, the reason I got really excited about this is that this book was written by P.A. Osiachon. And I have to yet, but we'll do it in the near future, do an episode on a book of his that I really, really love. Uh, and it's called Ireland, A Journey Into, a Journey into Lost Time, uh, which I'm glad is part of the collection. So this one I'm really looking forward to because he speaks, he writes quite a lot uh, 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 about the mythology of the Aran Islands in there. So that'll be a future episode, hopefully. Uh, Shane Broderick says, excellent book, good stuff, Shane. Uh, Shane obviously owns one. You're, you're a lucky man. I couldn't resist because I have an earlier edition of it, um, uh, picking up the Collins Guide to Stars and Planets. Uh, Believe it or not, it was exactly this sort of book uh, borrowed from the library here in Drogheda uh, in the uh, well, the early 1980s, actually, uh, that got first got me hooked on astronomy. And I'm currently uh, writing a book about astronomy. My, my latest work uh, at this stage, I have 63 and a half thousand words written. And as you probably know, because I've said it a few times, Vicky Wallace Southerl is in the house. Chili says it was a it's a great fish book. <laughs> and Federica says that I have that book about the Aran Islands. Brilliant. Paddy McAvoy is in the house. Jirev Akarjigale. Spoiler alert: Heaven is where the Irish originate. <laughs> Absolutely. Mary Platt is in sunny California. Good evening to you. Oh, you're right, Shane, about the maps, by the way. Shane points out something, and uh, they are intact, I'm glad. Well, it is intact. There is a lovely pull-out uh, map of the Aran Islands in the back of the book. Uh, fabulous. So anyway, some of these are treasures, and they were for sale in a charity bookshop for far less than they're, than they're worth. Uh, some of you may have seen the other day on uh, the Mythical Ireland community that I... Um, I got another uh, John O'Donoghue hardback, uh, Benedictus, uh, and it is in beautiful, pretty much as new condition, in fact, uh, bar one or two tiny, tiny scuff marks on the dust jacket. It's in beautiful nick. Uh, I've, I'm adding that to, I have three other uh, O'Donoghue hardbacks. Uh, this one I wasn't familiar with. Uh, and uh, when I looked it up, I found that it was actually uh, quite well respected and that is, it's a book called Celtic Mythology, and the author is Ward Rutherford. And I know that perhaps uh, some of you might be familiar with that. Uh, excuse me for the fact that when I peeled off the sticky label, it left some sticky behind. <laughs> I'll have to figure out a way to uh, to clean that off. But anyway, uh, apart from that, these are secondhand books after all. Really looking forward to that one. Um the mythology of the Celts can justly be claimed as one of the jewels of the European cultural heritage. Absolutely agree. It is, to begin with, a supreme literary achievement, particularly in the Irish stories. Abundance of incident and lively characterization shine through even the late, decayed and often bodorized versions that have come down to us. There is comedy in the midst, as well as profound, tragic vision and moments of penetrating psychological insight. C.G. Young would be proud. So that's one for a future episode when I get a chance to read it. Paula Snow Queen says, alcohol cleans the sticky off. That's if I have any to spare when I'm finished. What kind of alcohol? <laughs> John Major Jenkins writes some nice stuff. Worth a read. Many thanks. Looking forward to your next book, says Tasha Graham. Brilliant. Julie Gerst says, great books. Thank you. Uh, very glad. Uh, I forgot to say, I did a hello to Evan. Hello, Evan. Um, I hadn't seen Evan uh, or uh, uh, Vicky since last week or the week before. Uh, I also picked it up because it's a lovely hardback uh, edition with, you know, a nice dust jacket, a reprint of an old book. Uh, and it's uh, Greece and Rome, Myths and Legends. Uh, and that was published originally. Actually, that's a good question. It's, 
says says or says I don't, can never make up my mind whether I whether I pronounce says says or says uh, not entirely sure it looks like it was done at exactly the same time as Charles Squire's Celtic mythology it's it's laid out exactly the same in the same typography uh, but this is a Bracken books reprint from 1985 very nice and one worth having on the reference shelves uh, one I couldn't resist picking up because it's an area that uh, uh, is little sort of known about and this is a, a very large format book called the Follies and Garden Buildings of Ireland. Uh, Marianne Dunkinja is in the house. Hello, Marianne. Just got here from Connecticut. Hello, good evening to you. Uh, and James Howley is the author. Um, Yale University Press. A beautiful book, very well put together. Now, um, it published in 1993. So I suppose I have a passing interest in Follies. What is a folly? You know, uh, these uh, architectural uh, oddities, uh, small towers and uh, gazebos and uh, various uh, different buildings that were uh, put up over the last few centuries. Uh, I, I have particular interest in, uh, there's one on top of a, if I can find it, of course, it's just when you're looking for stuff, you can't find it. Not far from me here in Drogheda, um, I did see a picture of it a moment ago. Is uh, the the entrance gate to Balls Grove, where the Ball family lived for a long time? That is now a housing estate. the The old estate house is still there, but the lands uh, that uh, belonged to the Ball family were bought by the local council in the fifties, I think, in the sixties, and and a public uh, housing estate was put in there, but. Of interest in particular was there's a there's a folly on a mound very close to Fornox, um, Herbert's town, uh, but it's there's a, the the place name is actually rendered slightly differently here. Of course, I can't find that either in the in the index. It's again just when you're looking for a picture that you can't find it, and that's a very interesting one because it's on top of a mound, and I assume the mound, as I think archaeologists do, to be. Uh, 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 an ancient uh, mount, possibly a Bronze Age barrow, possibly a Neolithic passage tomb. The fact that it is uh, a few hundred meters, maybe ah, could be a bit more, could be a better kilometer to the east of the Fornox compact. There, there it is, actually. Uh, Harbour's town is how it's rendered here. But there is the folly that was built on top of the mound at Herbert's town. Now, I went looking for there's a folly behind Newgrange, as many of you will know. It looks a bit like an ice house or whatever. No mention of it, apparently, in this book. I can't find any mention of Newgrange in the index. But anyway, that's definitely one, I think, worth having on the reference shelf. And uh, two more before we get finally talking about what we're here to talk about. Uh, the Cult of the Sacred Centre, Essays on Celtic Ideology, and that is by the late Pruntius Macana. Uh, that was recommended by Erica Rivertree on the Mythical Ireland community. It's one I hadn't come across, and it's based upon a series of essays composed by Macona over the course of his career. At the time of his death, he hadn't gotten round to publishing them, uh, but uh, that uh, duty uh, was taken up, I believe, in conjunction with a, perhaps one of his offspring. I can't exactly remember. I haven't... Uh, completely read it yet um yes uh well one of one of the members of his family was involved uh and uh, the essays were edited and put together anyway this i, I was immediately fascinated uh, because he was referring to the fact that you know, Ireland in medieval times, as we've, we've often said, was very fragmented from a political standpoint. There were so many uh, provinces and kingdoms, so many rival uh, kings fighting against each other. But at the same time, uh, uh, from a mythical standpoint, uh, there seemed to have been a unitary vision, uh, you know, um, that that that. Uh, fragmentation uh, of the country politically was not reflected uh, in uh, in the, the, the beliefs and the spirituality and the mythology, etc., etc. 
uh, where, where there seemed to have been a, a fairly unified vision. Looking forward to reading that and actually looking forward to reviewing it. Of course, uh, all these things uh, require time. And uh, well, let's just say, uh, even though uh, the pandemic has perhaps given some of us a little bit more of that, uh, it, there still isn't enough. So maybe for Christmas, we'll all ask for 48 hour days and 14 day weeks. I don't know how you feel about that, but definitely we want five day weekends. Um, and the last one, I think I might have mentioned last week, uh, which uh, is uh, Mapping Death Burial in Late Iron Age and Early Medieval Ireland by Elizabeth O'Brien. That is a very academic work. Uh, I've, I've dipped in and out and immediately fascinated by a few little bits and pieces. Uh, it is written and laid out very much in the style, almost like an extended uh, archaeological report. But um, I believe it is the first, or perhaps it claims to be, and if I'm not right about that, I take it back, uh, the first to take an interdisciplinary approach into burial practices and to chart the development of burial rites as they occur in the archaeological record of the late Iron Age and early medieval period. So looking forward to getting some knowledge out of that. So that's the collection. The ever growing. There are no room for those on the shelves, by the way. That is another issue. Uh, but as I keep saying, you, you, you never have too many books. You just have, you don't have enough shelf space. Um, uh, the Woodsies from Monaster Boys are in the house. Good evening to you. Uh, guilt archaeology. Git, git archaeology. Sorry, not guilt. Git archaeology. Is that to do with guitars? Ancient guitars. The environment requires proactive maintenance. You are doing a great, though I'm sure at time, challenging job. Uh, Sue Prenter says, well said, Anthony. Read trolls. Yeah, look, I'm sorry to even have to talk about it, but uh, from time to time, we do encounter difficulties. And look, I wish these people well, but uh, I just don't want them around our group. Simple as that. Uh, anyway, um, tonight we are talking about the origins of the Irish by J.P. Mallory. Now, I have to tell you this, right? This is very interesting. I went looking earlier on and I couldn't find it. I suspect uh, he gave a talk uh, and that was on YouTube. Uh, now, sorry, the Mapping Death author... Uh, Elizabeth wants to know is Elizabeth O'Brien is the author of that uh, the Facebookers will see that backwards unfortunately oh by the way I should mention on YouTube you may comment I'm using a new microphone tonight for the YouTube uh, stream you might comment on whether it's good bad or you didn't notice any difference uh, thank you for that uh, so there's a story to um, the origin of uh, the origins of the Irish. It was published in 2013 by Thames and Hudson. And there's a beautiful indent of the twin dolphins that are the symbol of Thames and Hudson in, in the hardback cover. It's beautifully done. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a talk uh, that Mallory gave. Uh, I, I can't even remember where it was, but I remember watching it at least a couple of times and being very entertained. He's a very, very... Uh, <clears throat> uh, witty scholar he has a good sense of humor very self-effacing by the way which is something uh, that uh, uh, endears me to him great uh, yes a couple of comments there to say uh, crystal clear sounds very clear and crisp tonight good yeah so if i tap on it like that you should hear and if i bring it up close it'll be it'll be clipping because it's too loud but um yeah uh, that's the that's the new condenser microphone um so uh, one of the things that Mallory looked at in The Origins of the Irish was the genetics. And so I want to say something else before we just get completely stuck in, and that is that there are a certain number of people who believe the Irish to be a race. Uh, and that's very, very difficult. It's, it's a very complex area. And it's very difficult to... to in fact, it's impossible to tease out uh, a particular um, Irish race because there are so many influences and because there were so many invasions over the course of history and prehistory, uh, as mirrored, by the way, in our mythology, um, Laura Gawala, etc., etc. But 
a few years after the publication, Mallory was giving a lecture. And during the course of the lecture, he said that the section on um, genetics had to be completely reworked. And forgive me for using uh, the language, but I'm only quoting the man's exact words. He said he had to completely rewrite a section of it. I think it was about three and a half thousand words because it turns out that the original was, quote unquote, utter shite. <laughs> he said this at his own lecture, as I say, very self-effacing, something that would endear me greatly to him. Uh, and, and that's because, as I've been saying in episodes, particularly we did a couple of episodes about uh, Newgrange 10, NG10, that very famous uh, announcement in uh, Ju June or July of this year. Uh, Dr. Lara Cassidy uh, and uh, Dan Bradley and their colleagues having discovered that a male buried in Newgrange was the product of an incestuous relationship. Uh, but genetics is a science that is rapidly and vastly sort of uh, uh, overhauling uh, what we know about the past. It, it has told us more in the past five or six years uh, than we could ever have guessed in several generations of specialization involving you know, uh, archaeology, anthropology, uh, you know, linguistics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is one area that really has uh, s sort of given us some some great surprises and insights into the past. So, for instance, one of those insights that we've been given is that uh, that gentleman that we me mentioned buried at Newgrange was related distantly uh, to some of the people buried at Carrow Keel in Sligo on the Brickleaf Mountains. Uh, fascinating stuff. But uh, because the the uh, uh, and, and and of course the, the sample data set. Thank you, Coda. Um, Coda is chasing the, the cats out of the garden, or uh, maybe they're running across the wall. Uh, the data set is increasing all the time. Now, the unfortunate thing about the Neolithic is quite a lot of the uh, the bodies were cremated, and of course, cremation removes uh, the possibility of uh, extracting DNA. Uh, so. The, the data set for the Neolithic may not expand uh, uh, as, as much as we would like it to. But there are unburnt uh, bone fragments found in many places as well. Uh, so what I propose to do first is to read a very good, uh, because I think it provides us with a very good summary uh, of the origins of the Irish. Uh, and this was put together by uh, Neil Robinson who was Professor of Politics at the University of Limerick. A very favourable review. And then we'll just dip in and grab a couple of sections to read from Mallory's work so we can get a flavour of it. Julianne Osborne is in the house. I love your book talks so very much. Yes, uh, and the only thing that people complain about is that they then have to buy the books. And first of all, their, their wallet is emptying. And second of all, same, same issue, running out of, of shelf space. Desiree Riley is in the house. Hello, Desiree. Matthew Bessel is in the house, says, Slauncha Tua, Gay Kelts. Hello, Matthew, and all your friends. Cy B says, good evening. I'm looking forward to tonight. Hello, Cy. Nula Doyle is in the house. Hello, Nula. Uh, good. Uh, Doris O'Hara is here. Hello, Doris. Okay. Um, so I hope you're all comfortable. J.P. Mallory's The Origins of the Irish is a brilliant exploration of the prehistory of Ireland and the Irish. The story that Mallory tells is not about what it means to be Irish today or about the historical roots of contemporary Irish national identities. Rather, Mallory looks at the forces and peoples who come before the first person who we can claim to be both a real Irish historical figure rather than a mythic one. Denise Murphy says, thank you. I learned so much from you. D Denise, I stand on the shoulders of giants, as you know. Uh, so quite a lot of this is other people's work that I'm very, very glad uh, to to uh, uh, to give snippets of and uh, summaries of. Uh, like the surname, by the way. Chris Haney Lang is, says, howdy from Arizona. Hello, Chris. Hope it's still nice and warm in Arizona. Uh, May Fina Callahan says, Hello, Anthony, all the two. I just realized I have a copy of the 2018 version of this book, which is very important because that's the one with the more accurate um, uh, um, genetic uh, material in it. Mallory identifies Niall Nigulloch 
that's Niall of the Nine Hostages to you and I, as the first Irishman to begin to step out of myth and become part of conventional historical record. Very interesting. There are plenty of myths about Niall and how he came to succeed his father and claim the high kingship of Ireland, but he did exist. Niall created a dynasty, the uh, Inail, uh, the, the, the ones we've mentioned in lots of, of uh, uh, live Irish myths episodes, uh, who, who had uh, dynasties in uh, the north and uh, centred upon Tara, uh, the uh, Canel Noganach and the Clan Coleman. Uh, uh, the Inail, which ruled for 600 years after his death in around 450 AD. Uh, Robin Rickman says, I just started this book myself. Brilliant. You'll find it riveting. I know you will. Uh, a few people saying uh, hello to Coda. <laughs> uh, yes, <clears throat> Coda, you're very popular. If only they knew what what a uh, what a, a nutbag you are. <laughs> he is his loopers, but he's only a pup, you know. From Niall Nigialok, Nigialok. I'm trying to pronounce that right. Ni is nine. Gialok uh, is hostages. We can recount the history of Ireland. From historical records and narratives, it was one of his sons who refused baptism from St. Patrick at Tara. Before Niall Nigialoc, piecing together what made Ireland and the Irish is a matter of geology, geography, archaeology and linguistics. These are all complex subjects, but Mallory leads us through them gently and with humour. Geology comes first. Ireland's location shaped who could people Ireland, where they came from, and what they needed to bring with them. As so often in history, Irish unity was long in the making, and its place in the world changeable. It took millions of years for the landmass that was to become Ireland to form, and many more millions for it to be pushed by geological forces from what is today the coast of Australia to our current location. Yes, you heard that right from the coast of Australia. This is the sort of thing that happened over hundreds of millions of years, by the way. It's not at all in the recent history of the land. Once in place, the landscape was shaped by ice ages. Of course, you'll know that I'm very interested in the so-called Iapetus Suture, which I wrote about in my book, Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past. Uh, the Iapetus Suture. So everything north of that, that runs from Clarehead on the coast here near, near Drogheda, uh, all the way down to the uh, Shannon Estuary. Uh, and everything north of that was once part of a continent, uh, a continental mass uh, called Laurentia. Well, modern day geologists came up with these names and everything south of it uh, was on a continental landmass called Avalonia. The two came together around 420 million years ago. And the cons one of the consequences of that is that uh, the fossils found in rocks to the north of Clutterhead are vastly different to the fossils found in rocks to the south of Clutterhead. Fascinating stuff. And as I'm always saying, uh, Ireland uh, was part of two different land masses from millions, hundreds of billions of years ago. And in our earliest myths, the, 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 the partitioning of Ireland uh, seems to have been a thing. Uh, Le Quinn uh, Le Quinn and Le Moga, uh, for instance, uh, and Eremon and Eber, uh, the brothers, the Milesian brothers who divided it north and south between them. As the Ice Ages ended, glaciers melted and began to form the seas that make I Ireland an island. Before the seas were fully formed, there may have been land bridges that linked Ireland to Britain and possibly France. These land bridges would have allowed plants and animals to colonise Ireland. Ireland was, however, disadvantaged by its location. I think actually from memory, uh, Mallory, not, there's no firm conclusion here, but I think Mallory leans more towards uh, the, the thought that there wasn't a land bridge at the end of the Younger Dryas, uh, that in fact Ireland had already been cut off by the time uh, the, uh, uh, by the, time the uh, Ice Age ended. Plant and animal life spread out from the south of Europe so that Ireland was the last location to be populated by flora and fauna. As plant and animal life moved north and west, biodiversity declined. France has around three, three and a half thousand native plant species. Ireland 
815. Britain has 32 species of mammals. Ireland, 14. Gondwana is what it's labelled on the map I'm looking at, the continent south of Laurentia. There you go, Maeve. Thank you for the information. Some plant and animal life found Ireland's environment inhospitable or simply could not make it overseas or soggy land bridges. Snakes never made it at all. So St. Patrick didn't have much of a job casting them out. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, Lexi is prompting us about Mallory's other book, In Search of the Irish Dreamtime, which we will be reviewing in a separate uh, episode of Book Talk. The limited biodiversity of Ireland strongly influenced its population by humans. People like flora and fauna came to Ireland later than to other parts of Europe. There is evidence of human habitation in southern Britain from around 270 thousand years ago but no evidence of humans in ireland until ten thousand years ago some of these early human settlers may have come across land bridges but more probably came by sea routes mallory reviews all the contending claims about where the first peoples of ireland came from and argues that the most likely jump off point for the population of ireland was the area around the basin stretching from southern scotland to northern wales and encompassing the uh, isle of man and it is a fact that I have stated in a few episodes, more than a few, and I've, I've written about it a couple of times, that per seems to wind up a particular type of person who perhaps has nationalistic and racial tendencies. And that is that the first Irish people were, in fact, Britons. <laughs> you say that to somebody who, who goes who bang on their chest about how proud they are to be Irish. Just to wind them up, you should say to them, you know, do you know that the first Irish people were from Britain? <laughs> Similar, of course, they'll deny that. You know, they'll say, oh, these academics don't know what they're talking about. Similar <laughs> tools to those used in these areas have been found by our Irish archaeologists. And some of the people living in the Isle of Man basin may have been encouraged to migrate to Ireland as they were pushing out of their home, pushed out of their homes by rising seas. Cathy May Dayo's in the house. Hello. What, wherever the first settlers came from, they were few in number. Ireland's more limited supply of game and plants made it a harder place for hunter-gatherers to survive. They may, may well have brought wild pigs with them to enrich their diet. And of course, that's one thing that we read in Mallory's uh, The Origins of the Irish, is that pre-Neolithic, when cattle and horses and sheep were brought into Ireland, uh, the main meat source was wild boar. And the alternative to that was fish. Uh, trout, salmon and eels from the rivers or shellfish from the coastal areas. It is little wonder that farming spread quickly when the Neolithic agricultural revolution reached Ireland around 3800 BC, with agriculture replacing the older hunter-gatherer lifestyle within a couple of centuries. Agriculture brought cattle, beer and bread and later horses. There is less doubt that farming reached Ireland predominantly from Britain than there is about the arrival of the first humans. Is it buffering, is it? Give it a moment. It'll sort itself out. I didn't mention the F word, did I? No, I don't think I did. So we can't blame the F words. Early farming settlements and tools found in Ireland closely resemble those found in Britain. Strong contacts between Ireland, Britain and the continent endured through the Bronze and Iron Ages, including trading links with the Romans, which helped to change Irish dress and weaponry. New products and technologies, whether they were the drinking and storage vessels of the beaker people or bronze weapons, styles of settlement, burial and ritual were imported through migration and assimilation or introduced by travelling craftsmen or groups of elite warriors. Yes, S. Clifford on YouTube raises an interesting point. That is, weren't recent discoveries of bare bones date back to 12 and a half thousand years ago? Absolutely. And you can read about that, in fact, on the Mythical Ireland blog at mythicalireland.com. And DNA suggests that the first Irish originated in the area of the Basque. Uh, yes, in that most modern Irish people are descended from the Beakers. Uh, and they came from Europe, I think, originating in Iberia and spreading out into Central Europe and then out uh, to the islands. Um, but the bare bones is an interesting one because it flies in the face of all this stuff about no evidence of human habitation in Ireland until Mount Sandel, which I think is around 9000 years ago, around 7000 BC, maybe 8000 BC, that sort of time period. Uh, but you're right. 
uh, humans were apparently butchering uh, uh, bears to, to, to probably to eat them in a cave in that's County Clare, isn't it? And I think that's the work of Dr. Marion Dowd. Uh, so the other one that is not mentioned here is the fact that in the National Museum in Ireland, uh, there's a piece of flint uh, found by Professor Frank Mitchell here in the Boyne Valley in Drogheda, actually here in my hometown, uh, which um, uh, uh, Mitchell uh, Frank Mitchell maintained had been worked by human hands 300,000 years ago. I think the greatest difference between Ireland and Southern Britain, where a lot of Paleolithic evidence is found, and I think I've said this before on more than one occasion, I don't mind repeating it, um, is that a lot of the evidence for Paleolithic was wiped out by the ice sheets. It was scoured away by ice and uh, uh, a lot of it was washed away by the meltwater. So that's one of the big problems. Uh, Mitchell maintained that this was a secondary location for the flint, that it, it hadn't originally been there. It had been perhaps washed, cast there uh, by some meltwaters, etc., etc. These included many of the artefacts and sites that we associated with Irish prehistory, hill forts, the ritual sites at Newgrange and Tara, gold torques and metal swords. Genetic and linguistic records support the idea of Ireland developing with the rest of Europe through trade and the migration of small numbers of people like craftsmen and warriors. Take note that a lot of the uh, genetic uh, the slash DNA uh, material uh, will have been superseded by later studies. Although there are so, oh yes, so definitely if you intend to buy the book, don't get the hardback first edition. Uh, get a later uh, paperback reprint uh, and uh, uh, reprint, is that what it's called? If it's updated, is it called a reprint? It's a new edition, isn't it? Uh, get the new edition with the changed material in it. Although there are arguments over the precise genetic origins of the first Irish people, it is fairly certain there were no great waves of migration after the Neolithic. And that, of course, is entirely in question now. A language related to Irish probably developed at the same time as the Neolithic Agricultural Revolution and was part of the Celtic family of Indo-European languages. The spread of hill forts and the emergence of a class of elite warriors, some of whom probably came from Britain and the continent, helped to transform this common language into what would become Old Irish. <laughs> Together, geography, language, agriculture and genes all made Nile of the Nine Hostages Mallory's first historic Irish man. Nile is not just the first historic Irish man for Mallory because he crosses the threshold between myth and record. Mallory argue, argues that Nile also lived in a geography that endures an Ireland of provinces that could be unified under his kingship. Nile's Ireland had five provinces, uh, Connacht, Ulster, Leinster, Munster and Meath. Uh, and of course, the fifth being represented by Isle of the Stone of Divisions uh, in, uh, in Ishnach. Uh, each of the provinces had a peculiar characteristic associated with it. Connacht's was learning, Munster's music, Ulster's battle and Leinster's prosperity. Some things change less than others. And that is extraordinary because a lot of that is still true to this day. Uh, fascinating stuff. The idea of the provinces and their character created what Mallory calls a politico-cosmology, a political sense of how Ireland was a single space that could be ruled. Yes, Matthew, this is Nile of the Nine Hostages is exactly the one uh, we're talking about. Although this politico-cosmology was only described after Nile's death in the Middle Ages, Mallory argues convincingly that it was part of the mental, tap, mental map of the High Kings of Tara based on ancient sites in the provinces that can be identified by archaeology. The Enail, he argues, were tapping into older ideas about the unity of Ireland when they justified their rule at Tara as unifying the four other provinces. It would still be some centuries before there was an Irish nation. That would need nationalism, but by Niall's death, there was something of a national consciousness, an idea that the inhabitants of Ireland were a people. Many people will disagree with this and, will, and see Irish national consciousness as coming later in the face of Viking or Norman incursions and conquests. Others, uh, Gordon Farrell. Hello, Gordon. Uh, there was a documentary hosted by a celebrity gardener, Child's Bone, 8,000 years old in Ireland. Uh, well, that would make sense. Yeah, I mean, that would be a Mesolithic. I wonder where that was found. I don't uh, specifically remember that one my, myself, Gordon. 
Others will see the very idea that there can be any kind of national consciousness before ideas of national nationalism develop as an anachronism. But whether you agree with Mallory's final, final conclusion or not, his book is a fine guide to the earliest inhabitants of the island. And yes, I have to say, I completely agree. Maeve Fianna Callaghan has very uh, uh, kindly uh, pasted in a link to the updated version of the book. Um, and that is, that, that is uh, very welcome. I'm going to read a little bit about the Neolithic uh, from Mallory's book. What time are we on? 45. Oh, we're OK. We'll go for an hour anyway. And sure, if anybody's kind of falling asleep or nodding off, sure, you know yourself, just hit the hit the snooze button, you know. Uh, am I missing anybody on uh, YouTube? Anything significant? Hibernia 63 is in the house. Hello. Luke Tracy is also here. Hello to you. Owen Graw says, this is Jordan in Iowa. Hello, Jordan. Ar Aaron Reed says, hello, Falja. Uh, and this is about changes in the Neolithic. The Neolithic is the term given to the period when an agricultural economy spread across Europe. Now, these are now um, uh, uh, Jim Mallory's words. Um, hi, Anthony, says Burr Whelan. Hello, Burr. Fault you. Hi, everyone. Good evening to you. The Neolithic is the term given to the period when an agricultural economy spread across Europe to replace the hunting gathering economy, economy of the preceding Mesolithic. It began earliest in Southwest Asia over a broad region stretching from ancient Palestine northward in an arc touching on Syria and Eastern Turkey around to the foot, foothills of the Zagros mountains of Iraqi Kurdistan. It spread beyond this fertile crescent, in quotes, by about 8,000 BC to arrive in Greece by circa 7,000 to 600, sorry, 7,000 to 6,500 BC. I doubt there'll be anybody pushing the snooze button, Maeve. I mean, I know it's funny, but come on, it's not that boring, is it? <laughs> on the Danube by circa 5,500 BC, the French coast by circa 5,000 to 4,500 BC, and finally, after a delay in southern Scandinavia, Britain and Ireland by circa 4000 BC. Gillian Smith says it's usually as a result of an outside threat that nationalism develops. And hello. <laughs> hello, Gillian. Always a pleasure to see you. How is life in Llangollen? Precisely how it spread is a matter of controversy, with archaeologists positioning themselves from one extreme, that is, Europe was essentially recolonized by farmers from Southwest Asia who replaced most of the earlier population, to the other, uh, which is domestic plants, animals, and the new technology spread from one indigenous population to the next without any substantial migration of farmers. Uh, most archaeologists find themselves somewhere between these extreme positions, but still argue about the balance between imported or local antecedents. I'm always saying this, and I, you know that many of my friends, I, I are many archaeologist friends, and I always say, if you put two of them in a room and say, I'm looking for an opinion on this subject, this archaeological subject, you will get three or four opinions from two archaeologists. If you don't mind embracing the fallacy, and I don't mean to demean them uh, or to mock them, as I say, many of them are good friends of mine, uh, but uh, let's just say uh, given the scant evidence uh, in some cases uh, from prehistory, they do tend to sit on the fence a little bit. But the fact that uh, Mallory is saying some of them occupy extreme positions is probably interesting for uh, the sake of scientific discourse. If you don't mind embracing the fallacy of the insidious dichotomy, we could crudely summarise this. Were the first farmers in Ireland really immigrants from the Near East? Or, pardon me, were they native Europeans? Yes, Coda is arguing for the latter. He says they were native Europeans, definitely. Yes, yes, good. Thank you for your input, Coda. As always, very welcome. The appearance of the Neolithic in Ireland is marked by major changes in almost every aspect of culture. And of course, that much is true. Later Mesolithic campsites give way to settlements consisting of from one to perhaps three solidly built timber houses that measured circa 6 by 12 metres in size. The interesting thing is that the early Neolithic houses are rectangular and almost everything else they built was sort of quasi-circular, oval, egg-shaped or circular, you know. The settlements, so far as we can determine, would have been occupied throughout the year 
as the new agricultural economy did not require the whole community to undertake seasonal uh, uh, movements. Yes, Desiree, he is absolutely full of his opinions tonight. The settlements are small and accord with the traditional pattern of Irish dispersed settlement rather than the type of nucleated settlement that the earliest farmers engaged in across much of continental Europe, i.e. most Europeans lived in villages, while the Neolithic Irish usually occupied either isolated farmsteads or smaller small clusters of houses. To an extent, that sort of continued, didn't it? You know, those isolated farmhouses today in rural areas. But there are villages, of course, as well. There's a mixture of both. The earlier toolkit was replaced by a new set of stone implements, notably arrowheads, javelin heads, and a variety of new scraping tools, all fashioned according to a, a different tradition of flint napping. A fundamental marker of the Neolithic across most of Europe is the polished stone axe, an implement whose surface was originally flaked into shape and then ground down to a smooth finish by abrasives such as sandstone. We have seen that in Ireland, polished stone axes were already in use during the Mesolithic, but the Neolithic marked a virtual explosion in their presence. We have over 20,000 examples. Neolithic craftsmen exploited many new and harder types of stone and exchanged the axes not only across Ireland, but also with Britain. Ireland's long apparent isolation from Britain that seems to have typified the later Mesolithic, and by the way, that has been proven to be the case by Dr. Lara Cassidy et al.'s study uh, of the genetics, uh, that uh, the Irish in the Mesolithic, uh, those who were living in Ireland, uh, were quite isolated from Britain and Europe, and there wasn't much interaction. But that uh, uh, isolation comes to an end, and we find both good circumstantial as well as incontrovertible hard evidence for frequent contacts between the two islands. In addition to new stone tools, we have the introduction of ceramic technology, the fashioning and firing of clay to make pottery. And I think what uh, Mallory, uh, tongue in cheek, if you don't mind me saying, uh, might have been implying is that in the Neolithic, uh, there was no there was no hard border between Ireland and Britain. Uh, yes, we'll not mention Brexit. Let's not go political. Barbara Murphy says in late, but question, are they talking people coming in or ideas and techniques? They're actually talking both, Barbara. The argument was that you know, there are different extremes uh, that, you know, there was an entire influx of people from the Eastern Mediterranean, the Fertile Crescent. Uh, uh, and of course, the other side of the argument was no, uh, the people of the Neolithic were native Europeans, uh, but it was uh, the, uh, as you say, the ideas and techniques that had migrated. The subsistence economy, although not very well represented in the archaeological record, sees the first appearance of domestic cereals and animals. The new cereals consist of wheat, generally the preferred cereal in terms of consumption, and barley, a hardier plant that became increasingly popular in Ireland as wheat all too often proved difficult to grow. Uh, and let's not say, let's not say uh, uh, what barley is needed for. No, absolutely, Paul, us, no queen. Agree 100%. We are not going to do politics. Uh, Paul Terry says, enjoying from Wisconsin in the USA. Hope to return next June. Hopefully you will get that opportunity, Paul. You'll be made very welcome. Where was I? Yes, wheat was difficult to grow, so barley was a hardier plant that became increasingly popular. At some time during the Neolithic, it is likely that a form of wooden plough was introduced. In the Mesolithic, the dog was the only domestic animal known. But with the Neolithic, we see the introduction of domestic cattle, sheep, goats and pigs. The Neolithic represented a gastronomic revolution as well. This was not just a matter of adding to the meat on trays. Now fish, perhaps the main staple of the Irish Mesolithic diet, was apparently off the menu. And I think that's fascinating. Chemical analysis of Neolithic skeletons across Northwest Europe indicate that there was a major shift from a marine to a terrestrial diet as, as at least among many early farmers, fish seems to have become taboo, almost as if the previous staple had been culturally rejected. Absolutely fascinating stuff. One of the many, many fascinating insights of Mallory's book, and one of the reasons that you have to have it on your bookshelf. You just have to. And if it doesn't fit on your bookshelf, well, you can put it on the floor in the pile of won't fit on the bookshelves books. And both the production of cereals and the need to maintain open pasture for livestock saw the first major human impact on the Irish landscape 
as areas of previously virgin forests were cleared for agriculture. A striking indication of how the landscape was brought into use is the cage of field system of County Meath. Sorry, County Mayo. Oh, don't make that mistake, Anthony. Oh, with my apologies to the Mayo folk who will be no doubt, no doubt uh, uh, with noses out of joint as a result of that statement, uh, mistaken statement. Kilometres of parallel stone field walls that date from around 3500 BC onwards. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy around the dating the cage of fields, but uh, I'm, from what I'm hearing from my archaeological friends, the uh, the older dates are preferred. The changes in religion are probably the most visible Neolithic innovations. The Irish landscape is marked by over 1,600 megalithic tombs, large stone structures that usually housed human remains and most likely also served as centres for religious ceremony. <coughs> Excuse me. Although we can say very little, if anything, solid about the belief systems of Neolithic populations, it seems very likely that they reflected a new religion or religions. These monuments would have met the needs of the worldview and social requirements of farmers. And some would argue, Lexi has six piles of books that won't fit on the bookshelf. I feel your pain. And some would argue may have been one of the mechanisms for enticing local hunter gatherers into the new cultural system. Denise says, I thought I thought the original Irish were Vikings migrating to Ireland. Oh no, 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 no. The, the, the Vikings undoubtedly there are plenty of people with Viking DNA in the mixture, but no, 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 no. It goes it goes back a, a lot further than the Vikings, uh, perhaps three, three and a half thousand years. Society would have changed very much as well. To begin with, farmers must control land on an annual basis, and hence concepts of land ownership, largely foreign to mobile hunter-gatherers, unless they found it worth their while to claim particularly advantageous fishing rights, would have accompanied the spread of farming. Stable settlement also impacts on one's ability to accumulate goods. Hunter-gatherers regard... Rega this is very interesting. Hunter-gatherers regard most material possessions as impediments to mobility. In other words, in the Mesolithic, people didn't own much stuff, uh, unless it was something that could be tied around your neck uh, or, 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 or carried in, a, in some sort of a, a bag on your waist. Uh, fascinating. And so, uh, and so the Neolithic generally marks the emergence of a concept of surplus wealth and social ranking, or if you prefer, waste, greed, and discontent. Fascinating stuff. Stable settlements may also have influenced residence rules, the customs that determine with whom or with whose relatives one lives after marriage. The size of the megalithic tombs and the effort required to clear land and erect field walls suggests that labour could be harnessed towards single purposes on a far greater scale than anything imagined in the Mesolithic. And we see that, of course, very dramatically in the Neolithic and the late Neolithic uh, periods at uh, Brun uh, a big, a big uh, area of interest of mine, as you know. While mutual cooperation is always possible, take note, large labour projects have often been seen to indicate the emergence of some form of social elite. So this is Mallory writing in The Origins of the Irish in 2013. Well, that's when it was published. You may have written it earlier than that. Sort of nearly forecasting uh, what was going to be revealed by the, the, uh, uh, the genetic study that was published in 2020, which basically said the same thing, uh, that... Uh, you know, the, the, the finding of a male buried in Newgrange whose parents were first degree relatives, in other words, e either brother and sister or uh, mother and son or father and daughter uh, is uh, certainly uh, a sort of a red flag for a, uh, a, 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 a ruling dynasty, a social elite, a ruling dynasty and a social elite. It's not necessarily the same thing. Finally, and for the purposes of our own discussion, most importantly, the Neolithic would have brought about a major expansion in population. 
The size of hunter-gatherer populations must be restricted to ensure adequate resources throughout all seasons. A settled way of life in which humans can control their own resources led to major population growth, not only by providing greater, greater food supplies, but also by removing the need for mobility, allowing couples to reduce the spacing between births and permitting larger families. So what Mallory is saying is that effectively the Mesolithic lifestyle was a form of birth control by necessity. Moreover, because farming involves major cooperative efforts such as field clearances and harvesting, it actually encouraged the growth of family size. It is with the Neolithic that we see the emergence of the ethic of fertility, encapsulated in the biblical injunction to increase and multiply, which is now being challenged by world overpopulation. An increase in the overall population also resulted in an increase in population density and the number of people who would customarily interact with one another. Michael Winstanley, uh, sorry, I just want to interrupt just for a moment because Michael asked a very interesting question on YouTube, which I will address briefly if you just give me a moment. Uh, Michael's question is, does anyone know what was happening with the climate during this time? Well, what I can tell you, Michael, is that, and, and, and if you want to sort of get into this in more detail and more depth, um, I recommend Robert Hensey's book uh, called New Grange First Light, uh, because Hensey, and he may be summarizing the work of others, uh, s says that the, the climate very much took a decline uh, during the ne Neolithic, that... Uh, the climate uh, uh, in the early Neolithic in Ireland, circa 4,000 uh, versus the climate in circa 2500 BC uh, when the, uh, the changeover uh, to the, uh, the beaker influx is happening, uh, where it was apparently a bit colder and a bit wetter. More challenging situation for the growth of crops, something that I mentioned again in Mythical Ireland, my book, uh, New Light on the Ancient Past, from the point of view that I speculated, and that's all it was, was speculation, that perhaps the reason that uh, we had gone from, not, not that the monuments on the Sligo Mountains or the monuments of Loch Crewe are not spectacular in their own right, but we went from uh, modest-sized cairns, uh, you know, anything from 10 to 20 to 30 to 50 metres in diameter, to these gigantic, ostentatious expressions of human endeavour uh, at Newgrange, uh, Nouth and Douth, uh, being sort of 90 metres across, uh, that perhaps the monumental efforts that they put in were a means of appeasing uh, their, their weather deities. Uh, perhaps they saw that growing crops was becoming more difficult, and this was part of what they needed to do to appease, as I say, the Dagda. He who, according to the mythology, built New Grange, uh, but also was the one who controlled the crops and the weather. In fact, even after the Milesians took over, uh, he was still interfering. Uh, um, he was still able to cause their crops to fail uh, and uh, they had to entreat him. Uh, they had to uh, plead with him uh, to, 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 to leave things uh, in, a in a better state. By the end of the Neolithic, the population of Ireland was far greater than in the Mesolithic. Moreover, no other influx of population into Ireland during prehistory would have been anything more than a fraction of the Neolithic population and its indigenous descendants. From a biological point of view, the Neolithic population of Ireland, whatever its origin, provides a baseline for defining the genetic origins of the Irish. And of course, this is part of the material that has been uh, completely revised because we now know that, in fact, uh, most of the modern Irish population uh, derive uh, their genetics uh, originally from the, uh, the Beaker uh, culture, which is the next one to arrive uh, after the Neolithic. He does ask, uh, still an interesting question, the big question then, is to what extent was the Neolithic the product of the local population or the result of new colonists to Ireland? And we are beginning to get some of those answers through uh, the, uh, the, the genetic uh, uh, examinations, the genetic work. And of course, don't forget that 
one of the things about Dr. Laura Cassidy's paper uh, was that uh, one of the dates from uh, Paul Nebron, uh, the uh, wedge to no the uh, the dolmen in um, in Clare uh, was that uh, uh, there was a a, a thirty eight hundred BC date uh, there, uh, which which I think uh, sort of conforms with Mallory's uh, hypothesis uh, in this chapter about the Neolithic. When he asks the question when uh, that we're looking at a likely sort of uh, uh, arrival date of around uh, 3800 BC uh, in terms of the spread of agriculture from Britain into Ireland. Uh, and the earliest date for that in Britain is in the very southeast of Britain uh, in 4050 BC, 4050. Yvette Tillema asks, weren't the beakers the Neolithic? No, they were not. Uh, the beaker, uh, beaker culture were the beginning of. Uh, uh, metallurgy, uh, uh, you know, and and brought uh, bronze uh, uh, with them. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly read uh, Maller, uh, a little bit from Mallory's end of the Neolithic or the uh, the late Neolithic, because this is an area of particular interest to me. Um, the types of tombs, both timber and stone, built in Ireland and sorry, in Britain and normally stone-built megalithic in Ireland indicate persistent contacts between Britain, Ireland and further afield. And again, I think this is, if you if you watch the video I shared about the Boyne and the ro role of the Boyne River in the late Neolithic at Brunibonia, you'll know that my, my strong feeling is, of course, that there was great cooperation between uh, those in charge of Brunibonia uh, and those uh, from parts of Britain, uh, perhaps from Orkney, for instance, uh, you know, I think about Anglesey uh, and Barclodia de Garras or whoever you pronounce that. I apologize, apologize if I butchered it. Uh, the giantess apron full, the fact that the same story persists about how it was built. The uh, as the same story as the uh, megalithic uh, cairns, the chambered cairns at Loch Crew. The largest of the Irish tombs comprise the passage tombs, such as Newgrange in County Mead. And this entire class of tomb has many parallels in Atlantic Europe, especially Iberia and Brittany. While some have suggested successions of Neolithic colonists or religious missionaries moving from the continent to Ireland, archaeologists today generally prefer more muted contacts. One possibility may be indicated by the fact that the largest of the Breton and Irish tombs share great engineering skills, the use of esoteric artistic designs along the passages and interiors of the tombs, and astronomical alignments. These suggest a learned class within society who, irrespective of the various ethnic groups involved, interacted with one another, possibly as pilgrims seeking religious wisdom. Moreover, that astronomical knowledge, most spectacularly evident in the alignment of the entrance of the Great Passage tomb at Newgrange on the sunrise of the winter solstice, also suggests the type of knowledge that might be required to navigate sailing boats from the continent to Ireland. By the late Neolithic, we find a horizon of a particular type of decorated, though in Ireland frequently undecorated, flat-bottomed vessel, grooved ware, which, if our radiocarbon dates can be trusted, has its origins in Orkney. This particular type of vessel spread widely over Britain, and in the past few decades, it has been uncovered with increasing frequency in Ireland. And of course, uh, the four-poster uh, small timber henge on the eastern side of Nouth, uh, uh, had grooved wear pottery in it. The evidence suggests that we are dealing with far more than the spread of a ceramic style, because such pottery is often associated with new ceremonial enclosures built built of earth and timber, uh, aka drone henge, LP2, etc., etc., either located in new areas or in the vicinity of earlier megalithic tombs such as the Great Passage Tomb at Nouth, where one of the few grooved ware burials in Ireland is known. Now, several more of those four posters have been identified in uh, geophysical study of uh, Bruna Bonia over the past couple of years. And of course, myself and Ken Williams found a very substantial one at Newgrange Farm uh, on the same night as we discovered Drone Henge. Uh, so I suspect uh, the uh, grooved ware uh, finds when eventually the archaeologists actually get down to dig into that earth uh, will increase dramatically. These new monuments comprise henges, circular ceremonial structures with a raised bank and a ditch on the inside, not always, as we see in the case of Drone Henge, precisely the opposite arrangement from that found on later defended sites. 
Other structures include timber circles and stone circles. The former may include rectangular structures, either roofed temples or excarnation platforms upon which the dead might be placed to decompose. Were the Milesians the Neolithic late early? Uh, the, the, according to the annals of the Four Masters, Yvette, uh, the arrival of the Milesians, uh, I, I said in Ireland that the setting's almost 1694 BC. Apparently that has to be uh, correlated and it's 1700 BC which is the middle of the Bronze Age uh, so Milesians if you accept the dates uh, in the annals are a Bronze Age arrival some other innovations that appear in Ireland presumably as part of the Grooveware complex are oblique arrowheads, discoidal knives clay loom weight shaped objects and, uh, and stone mace heads and in some areas the importation of flint from County Antrim uh, uh, as far away as County Meath. The nature of the ceremonies engaged in is unknown. And of course, if you've read my Drone Henge book, uh, you'll know uh, that I, uh, I did speculate wildly about the possibilities. But of course, uh, at the end of the day, admitting that we don't know. But feasting appears to be one element, especially the consumption of pork and whatever might have been contained within the grooved ware vessels themselves. That the new structures tend to be circular has led to the suggestion that the change in ritual involved an ideology circled, centred on the circle and that the cosmological system of the Grooveware horizon was based on a circle rather than like the populations of Mesoamerica, a square, etc, 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 etc. Let's read the summary and let's finish at that uh, because we're on an hour and 11 minutes. Conclusions. At 3800 BC, Ireland experienced a major revolution in almost every aspect of its culture as it adopted farming as, as an economic basis. Although there is some very small evidence for contacts between native populations and farming populations, the situation in Ireland does not resemble other areas of Europe where one can track the acculturation of hunt, hunting gathering populations. Thus, the cultural contribution of local Irish Mesolithic populations to the Neolithic would appear to be minimal. And again, I think that may have been revised in the Cassidy paper, which is well worth digesting again. Despite a few items to the contrary, the spread of farming would appear to have been a rapid affair, possibly taking about two centuries or less to cover most of Ireland. Although this does not mean that some Mesolithic populations did not survive longer. There is at present no credible evidence to demonstrate that the Irish Neolithic was appreciably more recent than the Neolithic of Central, Western or Northern uh, Britain. Many items of culture such as architecture, flint tools and especially ceramics and some megalithic tomb types appear to be nearly identical between Ireland and Britain and suggest either a common origin or persistent mutual contacts. The similarities between Ireland and Britain are so strong that, despite some problems of chronology, the source of much of the Irish Neolithic would still appear to be Britain. There is some evidence that the initial impetus for the Irish Neolithic derived from southern Brittany. If so, this may have opened up the seaway connections between Ireland and Britain, which prompted the close cultural similarities that developed between the two island islands. There were pre periodic contacts between Ireland and Brittany throughout the Neolithic, but these were never as close as those obtained between Ireland and Britain. At the end of the Neolithic, both Ireland and Britain participated in a similar ceremonial horizon involving the erection of large timber structures and the use of a radically new style of pottery, grooved ware. Now, chapter four, which we're not reading tonight, is actually called Beakers and Metal, and that's the bit that came next. Uh, uh, so uh, you'll have to buy your copy of The Origins of the Irish by J.P. Mallory, the wonderful uh, Origins of the Irish. Very interesting, uh, 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 very educational and at times very witty read, in, in fairness. Christian Gray Taggart is joining us uh, and didn't realise it was on there. Don't worry, you can, you can rewatch it now very shortly. Um, good stuff now. Um, Am I missing anything? Lou Lawfada is on uh, YouTube. Sorry, but facts trump your feelings. Druids and Jehovah not linked. Oh, I'm not going there. Uh, apologies, folks. I'm definitely not going there. Just before we go, I should mention that um, uh, just today published on the blog on mythicalireland.com uh, was the uh, announcement 
uh, that uh, the uh, solstice celebration at uh, Newgrange uh, this year is going to be uh, very different to uh, uh, to other years in that there are going to be no humans allowed inside Newgrange and I gather uh, none in the field at Newgrange either uh, and instead the event is going to be live streamed uh, without getting into uh, the trolling again uh, several people on Mythical Ireland today took exception to this uh, and one one person said that they were going to make a stand you know that this Covid thing is is just a, a myth and all this that and the other. I didn't expect that, but I suppose I should have expected because the internet's full of it. But um, I think it's a wonderful thing. I, I think it's the only sensible and obvious thing to do in a pandemic is to make sure that you you haven't got people entering a very small space like that where there's no ventilation, uh, even if they have masks on, uh, and instead live stream it because instead of twenty people uh, seeing it in the chamber. Uh, perhaps millions of people will be able to watch it. So I'm looking forward to it. It's something a little bit different. Yes, I will miss my annual visit to Newgrange. I've been there now uh, every year, pretty much for the past 20 years. I will miss it, and I will miss the opportunity to take the photos and share those with you and to do a few live streams and share those with you. But look, um, we'll w uh, the details haven't been announced as to exactly where the live stream is going to be, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or where, or on a website. That detail will emerge in the next week or so. And when it does, I'll keep you updated, you know. Uh, but I, I think it's a great idea. And, and uh, I think it'll just give everybody an opportunity. If it's done right, and hopefully it will be, I'm sure the OPW are hiring professionals to do it. Because uh, I know RTE did a broadcast uh, in Solstice 99, the, the dawn of the new millennium, and actually talked all the way through the sun. Uh, they didn't realize what they were seeing was the sun in the chamber because all you could see was the beam of light. You couldn't see anything else. It was dark. Uh, and so I think the, the camera technology has improved a lot in the last 21 years. Uh, and, and I'm certainly hoping uh, that it will be an interesting spectacle. The other thing that we have to hope for, of course, is that the Irish weather plays ball. Regardless, um, I will do my best to get out there at some point during the uh, solstice um, you know, uh, week, as it were, uh, and and to, to at least capture some images and perhaps do some sort of live broadcast from the road outside uh, during that time, just to bring it to you. Uh, and the fact that we're out of lockdown at the moment uh, means uh, that uh, that is uh, a greater possibility than it was before. Don't forget, uh, as always, if you haven't already done so, uh, if you're interested in getting a, a, a Mythical Iron 2021 calendar, there are still calendars left here in stock and we ship worldwide. Uh, so in case you haven't uh, ordered one and lots of you have, and it's great. And thank you very much for that, for supporting the photography. Uh, uh, you can you can get one at the link I just provided. Just going to hang around for a moment to see if there's any more questions. Sue Prenter says, great idea. We can all participate. Exactly. Uh, D Lynn says, don't know, Anthony, maybe you should drone it for us. There's an idea. Mm. Yes, let's see. Truska Den Bell says some people have even speculated that Ireland is a remnant of Atlantis. There's a huge amount of talk about Atlantis. You could write book upon book upon book about it, but the actual evidence uh, that Atlantis ever existed is, I, I think, very, very paltry indeed. And of course, there are so many different claims as to where Ant Atlantis is located. It's a very, very controversial area. And um, yeah, yeah. As I say, you could you could you could listen to the experts, so-called experts, talk about it for a long time, and you'd never be any the wiser where it was. Um, theories can be interesting, says Truska. Yes, indeed, absolutely, uh, and speculation. No, no argument there at all. Anne Hurley, he says, thank you so much for the journey tonight. Great as always, love and light to all. Yes, to you, Anne, also. I think the live stream is a fantastic plan, says Maeve, and a blessing for everyone to be able to see it exactly the way I feel about it. Uh, Chris says, thank you, Anthony. I think it's a great idea to live stream so more can enjoy it. Yeah, I think a lot of people are in, in, in agreement. Uh, Brendan, who's near Glendalock, says the OPW were doing a survey of St. Saviour's prior in, uh, Priory, I presume, in Glendalock last week. Very interesting, Brendan. Wonder when we'll see some uh, results from that. Tom King says, "Thank you, Anthony. Good day, good evening, my friends. Uh, see you again soon, Tom. Uh, it's going to be great." Says Anne. Yes, absolutely. Sloan, Sloan says Paula. 
Uh, Gordon says, I didn't expect that either. Newgrange needs to stay closed in these strange times. And yes, more. We'll see it virtually. Exactly. Will Coda snag Santa o over your shoulder for solstice? <laughs> uh, he will be in bed early Christmas Eve, let me tell you. Uh, great book talk, says Marianne. Thank you. And I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Thank you so much for these talks. I really appreciate the, oppor appreciate the opportunity to tune in, says Stacy Herman Lawrence. You're very kind to share with all of us. Good night. Oh, look, I'm very glad to do so, Stacey. It helps me, helps me keep on the right side of everything as well. Uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a very fulfilling thing to do. And uh, the fact that such a lovely community of people has built up around it uh, makes it especially nice. Anyway, in the meantime, uh, we are, well, the next scheduled uh, live stream is next Monday evening which is episode 128 of Live Irish Myths, and that will be the third and last instalment of Ka uh, Fiontri, the Battle of the White Strand, after which we will be moving on to other subjects. It's possible, I, I did say that we missed a book talk, was it last week or the week before, uh, and I, I have to make up for it, so I, it's possible I might. I'm, I'm busy at the weekend um, with uh, my father's own book launch, uh, which is happening virtually. Uh, and then I'm participating in another online forum. So the weekend is pretty much out. It's always possible I will do uh, an impromptu live stream uh, somewhere. In the meantime, the next, as I say, scheduled one is next Monday night. Everybody stay safe. Uh, do what you can do to keep yourselves safe and healthy. If that involves you washing your hands and using hand sanitizer, wearing a face mask when necessary, coughing and sneezing at the crook of your arm, social distancing and all that, just try your best to stay safe. Don't take any risks. And even if you're not sure whether to believe the experts that this is a thing, or you're better off not finding out, especially if you're in that uh, uh, category of, of, uh, of, of risk, uh, because it is not uh, by any means the same thing as a winter flu or a cold. Uh, Pamela says, thanks, Anthony. Going to order a calendar. They look great. <laughs> Good stuff. I love the book talks. Yes. So we'll keep uh, doing the book talks. Will there be a link to your father's book launch? Um, I'm not sure whether I should share that on Mythical Ireland because I'm not sure it's that relevant. Um, an interesting question, though. Let me think about that, Maeve. Yeah, let me think about that. Absolutely. Thanks, Anthony, says Sheila. Good night to you, Sheila. Janet Moran says, thank you, Anthony. See you next time, all. And Jerry Andrade says, okay. Everybody's saying good night. Good night, indeed. Daisy Peters, good night, Daisy. See you again. Brilliant. Ah, yes, some interesting comments on YouTube. And we're going to... Batteries ran out on me, says Dolmac. Ah, I, I have to leave it charged, connected to the charger during the live streams. Anyway, a very good night to you all. Thanks a million uh, for uh, watching. And uh, we'll see you all very soon. Uh, Slonga Fol, Ichawa Kolosov, August Tog, Gubbogay.